GCS TV viewers, it's Chris Nichols here again from the camera store, and we are finally going to look at the 1DX Mark II. Now, we're out here at the Wild Rose dirt bike track, so of course you're going to get a lot of noise, so deal with it there at home. And I want to see how fast this camera really is, because this is basically the biggest journalistic camera on the market next to the Nikon D5. And me these are both incredibly heavy i guess i haven't used these in a long time you know mirrorless cameras these feel so heavy now god now we already reviewed the nikon d5 and there's things we loved about it like the autofocusing speed and shooting rate and buffer depth but other things we didn't like like the dynamic range so can the 1dx mark ii beat this out which one is king of the track we're going to find out today all right, now joining us today from the camera store is Caitlin Kerr. Please check out her Instagram account. And uh, no, you cannot hear her talk because I have not put a mic on her yet. Uh, but what we're doing today is she's shooting on the Nikon D5. We're actually letting her shoot a camera. Last time you were on a video with us at the Glenbow Museum, we just made you carry our bags. And uh, I'm using the Canon 1DX Mark II, of course, today. We're going to compare these two side by side, exchange some notes, and kind of see what we think about them. And maybe even swap them back and forth and see what we get. Now, I should mention that Caitlin and I today are shooting on 7200 2.8s, Canon and Nikon respectively, and we're going to crop in too just to really make sure that we are getting in focus sharp shots. So on the 1DX Mark II, of course, like most Canons, you can customize your autofocus for different situations. Because I've got some bars and railings in the way, I was setting it for ignoring possible obstacles. Now I'm trying it out just on the general purpose setting and it's working very well. I'm putting my priority to focus because uh, we're getting a really high frame rate regardless. It's doing a great job. First shot is always in focus. This camera's just picking up and hitting it. If I put my camera on it like I'm gonna do right now, it just seems to grab it very accurately. Bam, like right in the air, no problem. As the biker is falling away from us, sometimes we lose a couple frames. But overall, it's doing a fantastic job, exactly what I expect from a camera like this. All right, guys, a little bit of a spec rundown when it comes to the new cameras now. First off, the Nikon D5 does have 153 autofocusing points, which I know sounds amazing, but keep in mind that only around 50 of those are user-selectable. Do those extra points really give us a lot more nuance and autofocus accuracy? Well, the Canon 1DX has 61 points that you can choose from, and looking the two side by side, guys, I'm having a hard time seeing much difference at all. Both are very customizable, both are bang on with those first shots. Now, the 1DX does give you a slight advantage, though, when it comes to frame rate. It's going to push 14 frames per second and 16 if you're shooting in live view. The Nikon D5 is going to go 12, and it's going to give you 14 when that mirror is locked up. Keep in mind, though, that the 1DX does have the hybrid autofocusing in live view. It's going to be more accurate than D5 and a little bit smoother and faster. Now, on the Canon 1DX Mark II, you get two card types to choose from. Now, CFast, which is very quick, but probably still the most expensive card type on the market, as well as Compact Flash to round things out. On the Nikon D5, you get either dual Compact Flash or dual XQD, both very fast card types. And when it comes to buffer depth, shooting to these cards well the Nikon does have the advantage you're pushing about 200 shots in raw the can around 170 but honestly both are ridiculously high and made for this kind of shooting that being said with the 1dx having that faster frame rate it could potentially fill up that buffer 10 seconds of shooting that is a lot but it could do it all right so what we're doing right now is we're shooting really really dark ISO 6400 on both cameras we're gonna see how they handle dynamic range at high ISO. Now the D5 is excellent for this because it does have that weird sensor where it seems to perform better at high ISOs than at low ISOs. So we'll take a look in just a bit and we'll see if we get a difference in the dynamic range. So we also wanted to push both cameras in the low ISO ratings as well. So we got these cranked down to 100 ISO and we've actually underexposed by quite a bit. We're going to see what kind of shadows we can pull out of that. 
All right, so we've taken lots of pictures. We've taken some video clips as well. We've certainly tested out the autofocus thoroughly, but I think we're going to change locations now because, you know, these cameras, although they're intended for sports and journalism and stuff like that, that's not all they're about. You know, we've got big full-frame sensors, relatively low megapixels. These promise to give the best high ISO performance and image quality overall for the respective brands. So we're going to take a look at the photos, form some opinions, and then head out to a new location and do some low-light shooting next. All right, so it's starting to get dark now and we're downtown in the Eau Claire area. We've had a chance to look at the files, play with the cameras. So what was your hit rate like getting photos? Quite honestly, between the two of them, it was really, really close. Yeah. I didn't notice on either one of them a significant miss rate, like at all. I totally agree with that. Barely missed any shots. I mean, no cameras would be 100% perfect, but these things are like the best for tracking and shooting and yeah. getting your shot in focus. What about the spread of the autofocus? I mean, we're not getting focusing points right to the edge of the frame. No, and I did, to be honest, I did find that a little bit frustrating. You know, on both of them, they're very, very centrally located. You compare it to something like the D500 or Sony's A6300. Sure, yeah. You know, those go out way further to the edge of the frame, whereas both of these, both the D5 and the 1DX Mark II, you know, they're, they're very central. You know, it's interesting, the D500 has the same focusing system as the D5, it doesn't miss at all either, and you're right, you get the whole frame coverage, but still, to be honest, most of the time, especially if you're doing journalism or sports, your subjects will be fairly centrally located, but yeah, the smaller cameras actually can track better and right across the whole screen. Yeah, I agree. But there have to be strengths and weaknesses with all the systems. And uh, I would still say the Nikon is going to have better tracking. 3D tracking always works so good on Nikons. Uh, you know, the Canon, you can't really choose what you want to track on. It has this new system for its wide field, but I still think Nikon has the benefit. Maybe that's because of those extra autofocusing points, but I'm going to give it to the, the Nikon on that. Now, what Canon did better, which was really cool, was live view autofocusing. Yes. A yeah. big, big benefit for video. Did you try anything at all? You know, I didn't try it out a lot. You know, I wasn't really in a situation today where I felt I needed to use the live view autofocus system. That I, being said. That being said, it's my line. I totally agree with you. I mean, unless you're shooting video, the hybrid's still going to be way slower than the standard phase attack. But yeah, Jordan loved it. And I agree, the Canon, especially with the touchscreen, way better for live view focusing. All right, guys, let's talk about video a little bit. And the 1DC actually does some stuff we haven't really seen in DSLRs yet. And the first thing is this camera can shoot 4K at 60 frames per second. Now, previously, if I wanted that, I was looking at like a Sony FS7. Now we're getting it on a camera that's less than $10,000. It is really sweet, and the quality of the 4K recording is really beautiful on this. Our light levels are getting pretty low, but it's a very clean image, and it's very, very sharp. Uh, now, the nice thing, too, is it's very sharp in 4K recording, also very sharp in 1080 recording. So, actually, a very well-rounded feature set on this. So, one other really nice thing with the 1DX2 is, I mean, you've seen this before. We've had some issues with this. Chris is filming me right now. I don't trust his ability to manually focus a lens. So, we're using the dual pixel autofocus on this, which is carried over from the Canon 80D. Works insanely well. And also, the 1DX2 has a touch screen. So, he can just tap my face, and we don't have to worry about the focus constantly drifting in and out of focus. And you can see from these examples here, actually did an awesome job tracking action. Uh, I was really impressed by it. I was thinking it might be good for walk and talks or something. I'd be totally happy using this for sports or journalism. So without a doubt, this is the best DSLR for video Canon's ever made, but honestly that's not saying too much because Canon has this irritating habit of just pulling features off to protect their cinema series, and this is no exception. It doesn't have Canon C-Log in it, which was in the 1DC before this. I don't know why it's not included in this, but the biggest thing that drives me crazy is Canon's using this outdated motion JPEG, and we said that this was a terrible thing back with the Pentax K5. Uh, it's still here in this. The file size is absolutely ridiculous. Shooting 4K 60, I was looking at just over six minutes of record time on it. And it's not even a wonderful color space. It's 8-bit. You can't grade it heavily. It's very sharp. It has next to no motion artifact. But the files are enormous. The first thing you're going to have to do is take them and convert them over to ProRes on your computer. It's a really silly format. And again, I think it's done just to protect the Cinema Series cameras. Now on top of that, this camera does shoot 120 frame per second at 1080, which is a really cool feature, but the footage, it is really soft, it's prone to aliasing issues, it's not great, so I would use it for the odd effect, but mostly I'd consider this a 60 frame per second camera in 1080 and 4K. And I certainly think it's a better all-rounder than the Nikon D5, unless you need long record times, but it's definitely not the ultimate flagship stills camera for video recording. All right, guys, so of course you've got everybody at the park doing what we've always done in parks, play Pokemon Go, but it's a good opportunity because nobody's paying attention to me, and I'm gonna shoot in the low light here at high ISOs. I've got my camera 3200, gonna take, oh, hang on one sec. 
Sorry, one sec. Oh, Magikarp, hang on. I'll be right back. All right, so we're going to head over here. Large collection of people. That's why I want to go over there. It has nothing to do with the double lured Pukui stop. Uh, I, I want to take photos. At some point, I will take photos. Why don't we start testing the low light performance of both these cameras? You know, push the ISO up to 12800. That sounds uh, great. Take a shot of some of these people over here and see what we get. Okay. Got it? I got a Magikarp, yeah. Caitlin, how are you finding the uh, autofocus in low light? It's not bad. Is it slower? Because yes. I'm certainly getting some slowdown too. Like, we're talking dark here, but. things I have to say about the Nikon that I do really like, these shiny buttons. I can actually see what I'm doing in the dark. It's great. All right, so I know we kind of were talking about it, low light autofocusing, and we were saying they're pretty similar, but now we swapped cameras, we've tried them. I'm gonna go ahead and say, actually, I think the Nikon is a better focusing camera in low light. Now we're talking, uh, both cameras doing a great job, picking up subjects even in very dark conditions, but I think the Nikon was just a bit snappier. Yeah, you know what, I'm inclined to agree. After I swapped them, um, I did notice the, the Canon was dragging just a, just a touch. Yeah, right, just certain yeah. shots would hesitate a little bit. Yeah. So we can certainly give that win to the Nikon. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the low light performance and the, the dynamic range between the two yeah, cameras Yeah, we did some samples well. for sure, yeah. Yeah, um, and you know, I've been shooting the Nikon all day and I noticed, you know, the dynamic range out of this camera is really quite amazing, but more notably at the higher ISOs. Yeah. You know, 6400 and up, it's cleaner than the Canon, you get better dynamic range out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but only at those higher ISOs. What it's do you strange. Think? Well, yeah, and it's it's such a reversal because then the Canon 1DX Mark II is definitely better at the ISOs below that. We're actually getting better dynamic range at the lower ISOs, cleaner results. It's so weird. I mean, the Nikon D5, we kind of found this when we did our review. It's very specialized, perfect for this kind of shooting, what we're doing yeah. right now. It's focusing better, you know, it's handling high ISO better. But the Canon, I think in more situations, is gonna be better overall. I mean, we're not usually yeah. shooting 6400 ISO. Yeah. So if you do concerts or knife photography, the Nikon is gonna win, but for everything else, the 1DX Mark II has better dynamic range and low light. And certainly, this is the best image quality that we've seen out of Canon sensors so far in the full frame. So, looking at both cameras, I don't know, it's hard to pick a clear winner, Caitlin. I know I'm a Nikon guy normally, you're a Canon shooter, you shot Nikon tonight, what do you think? Yeah, you know what, I was, I was really impressed. I wanted to give it to the Canon, but between the two, they're so close, and when it comes to the differences, you really are splitting hairs. Like, yeah, yeah you know, better low light from the Nikon, but autofocus is just so, so close, and it's, it's really tough. Yeah. I think, you know, going with either one of these, you know, you're not going to be disappointed. I think the Canon has better image quality during the day and in most regular shooting. So, okay, so we've talked a lot about the photo quality, but what about video? Do you have any interest in video whatsoever? Not really. Did you shoot any video today? No. I'm going to talk about video today. Then. I'll let okay. you. All right, sounds good. You know, it's funny, we talk about how the Nikon has certain strengths in certain areas and the Canon does in other areas, and it's the same thing with video, it's funny. You know, you think about the Canon 1DX Mark II, I'd say it's a better 1080 camera. We get the slow-mo, touch screen with the hybrid autofocus is way quicker. Uh, you know, it's sharp now, unlike old Canons where they're quite soft, they did a really good job in 1080. But when you go to 4K, I think the Nikon has the advantage, you know? Yeah. The motion JPEG on the Canon is just a deal breaker. Six minutes on a 64 gig card is ridiculous, especially when they're so expensive. Yeah. Back when Nikon could only go three minutes of 4K and that was ridiculous, it made sense. But now that Nikon's gotten rid of that limitation, I think it's a clear way to go. Yeah. Keep in mind too, the Nikon, you're getting a 1.5 crop on that. The Canon's giving you a 1.3 crop. That means that the Nikon, although it's not a big deal, is gonna have a lot of DX lenses that you can use for video. And the Canon, you're stuck using full frame and losing the wide angle. So. Again, a funny thing, just this back and forth battle with yeah. no clear winner. That's an interesting kind of uh, event that we've had happen today. 
So thanks again for coming and joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks Don't for forget, having me. Check out Caitlin's Instagram. There it is again. Check out Jordan and myself, our Instagram as well. Why not do all three at the same time? <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to tweet us with your comments. I know it's going to be a big battle between these two giant flagships, but I just want to end it with this one statement. Just to keep this in mind, guys. We're talking about these amazing cameras. They have fantastic features, but is anybody going to use these? Is anybody going to buy them? We're just not finding many people going for the large flagships. Yeah. I hated carrying this today. They're a big yeah. bulky device, and I think we need to leave it on that note. Small cameras like a D500 and the new maybe 5D Mark IV coming out, hopefully. Maybe. It'll be very, very exciting. Thanks so much, guys. Check Thanks. you out soon.